Because it hot that day. Almost as hot as Georgia, where Mama and I lived before we moved here, Chicago. Way too hot to stay indoors. A group of us built a raft out of some logs and sticks we found lying around. And boy, could it float. Once we were far out enough, we hung our legs over the side and kicked to propel it forward. It was glorious. We were trying to reach a marker several hundred feet south of our spot. We took turns cooling off in the water while holding on to the raft. We were splashing, playing, having a good time. We didn't realize it then, but our raft must have drifted out into the waters along the 29th Street Beach. That area belonged to the whites. Sunday, July 27th, 1919. Breaking news tonight from Chicago's South Side Lakefront. Mobs of people in a bloody battle sparked by a racial incident involving segregated swimming areas. Reportedly, a group of Negro youth on a raft drifted into an area claimed by whites at the 29th Street Beach. Witnesses say a white man started throwing stones at the children on the raft. A 17-year-old boy was knocked overboard and drowned. Gangs of both races escalated into violence. When police officer Daniel Callahan arrived on the scene and refused to arrest the 24-year-old man, George Stauber, whom Black said had thrown the stones. According to the Chicago Defender newspaper, news of Officer Callahan's negligence reached the black beachgoers at 26th Street, and a mob of 50 men marched to 29th Street to avenge the death of the boy. The officer's actions so enraged them, they pounced on the officer. He was chased to a drugstore where he summoned help. When police reinforcements arrived, the defender describes them as confronting a group of despondent African Americans. One of them allegedly fired a gun at the officers. They returned fire, killing him. The second fatality of the evening. It may seem bizarre that such a trivial mistake by children would ignite such a violent response. But one race's control over recreational space became an obsession for many white people in this period. I am Christopher Reed, retired professor of history at Roosevelt University. I specialize in African-American history, the experience in the 19th and 20th centuries. White-only beaches, swimming pools, and drinking fountains are hallmarks of this nation's Jim Crow era. Long after other public accommodations were integrated, these race-based restrictions remained in place. In the South, there were actual signs posted. In the North, there was an unspoken understanding. I was educated in CPS from kindergarten through 12th grade. I have a bachelor's degree from the University of Chicago. I have two master's degrees and I have a doctorate from Harvard University. And at none of those institutions did anybody tell me anything about the 1919 race riot in Chicago. I knew that there was something called the Red Summer, right? I knew about the Red Summer. I knew that, that this had been an important summer in our nation's history, but I didn't really know the details. And so already today, just by being here at the end of this, this session today, most of you probably know more about this event than I did when I started this project. My great, great aunt, Katherine Johnson, uh, experienced firsthand the many injustices against the colored soldiers during and after World War I. Her book, Two Colored Women with the American Expeditionary Forces, co-written with A.D. Hutton, may be the only real-time account of the discrimination experienced by the World War I colored troops. It was also a witness to their bravery and honor. There's an African proverb that says, until the story of the hunt is told by the lion, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. How does modern day storytelling measure up on issues of race? In what ways do today's media stand at the intersection of race and justice and public understanding? How have they come to shape the way we see the world and our place in that world? How do they affect the way we see each other? Do they continue to glorify the hunter? How do we tell our children about this epic event that most adults are just learning about and why should we? Can learning more about the long history of race relations in Chicago help young people to better understand where we are today? And how can knowledge about our history encourage our youth to be involved in creating a better future? 
uh, th there's something akin to that happening here, where, as the man stated back there, and we'll let us take it into this. All socialists are communists and all those other things are un-American, right? She taught there for about three years, but then she had already bought the house. On that hot July day in 1919, my life came to an end in the cool waters of Lake Michigan. And unfortunately, something else began, and its effects can still be felt 100 years later.